All right, I want to thank everyone for being here. Can you, is it just my, let's see, I see a big square. Is that just me? Oh, uh, that's, uh, that's, nope, that was me just, you can ah. confirm that it's okay. You have to record. Okay. With you. <laughs> I always panic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's all good. We're all good. All right. We are so happy to have you here, Dr. Kearns. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, have you on our, um, I like to call it our show. Um, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Donna Heitmanek, the um, founder and creator of the Facebook page, Science of Reading, What I Should Have Learned in College. And our mission is to get evidence-based practices into the hands of teachers. Um, Dr. Kearns has a long biography, so I picked the brief one. He's a very interesting guy. He's Dr. Kearns, PhD, is an associate professor of special education in the Department of Educational Psychology in the, help me pronounce this school, NIAG. NIAG. <laughs> NIAG, thank you. School of Education at the University of Connecticut. He is a research scientist for Haskins Laboratories at Yale University and the Center for Behavioral Education and Research at University of Connecticut. Devin conducts research on reading disabilities, including dyslexia uh, in elementary and middle school age children and designs instructional programs to assist these students. Devin also studies the neurobiological effects of reading intervention. He publishes articles for researchers and educators on reading difficulty and helps schools and districts implement high quality reading instruction. I have to say, um, I got, I'm kind of a fan of yours because I got, um, when I heard some of your interviews with uh, Dr. Seidenberg and um, your work with Catherine Pace Miles, I was very intrigued. And so um, you're kind of, um, someone that I've been admiring from afar. So I'm, I'm a fan of yours and I'm so glad that you're here to share your work with us. Um, so just a reminder to folks, we will have about 45 minutes, correct? Dr. Kearns of a presentation. And, yeah. um, and then we will be available for about 15 minutes of Q and A. And um, so if you have a question, um, put it in the, um, in the chat and I will be going through questions and, and helping Dr. Kearns with those. So Great. without further ado, Dr. Kearns. All right, you'll see, uh, uh, briefly, you'll see on the screen, uh, uh, something that's gonna go away in just a moment. Uh, and, okay. All right, so so I'm going to talk about um, all right. Uh, you should be able to see Donna. Is that true? I can see it. Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really thrilled to be here and to talk with you all. Uh, I'm going to tell you this uh, topic is near and dear to my heart uh, because something that as a teacher I really struggled with and I've learned a lot about it, and I'm really thrilled to share some things with you today. I'm going to um, have you, I'm gonna give you, put two things in the chat. So um, I can post them again later, but I'm put, I put in the chat a copy of the presentation. Uh -huh. um, and then I also put in there, um, Donna, let's do it. So I think, can you auto mute everybody? I am going to oh. auto mute just so you know. I want okay. to All right. Wait, Dr. Kearns, I can't, I don't know if everyone can hear you. Oh, sorry, that was, I got put on mute somehow. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, so I'm going to start by talking about uh, science-based reading instruction, why it's important briefly, uh, and then I'm going to talk about polysyllabic words and syllable level strategies. Uh, I also have slides on morpheme level strategies, but in the short time we have, uh, we probably won't be able to get to them. I put them in there for your future reference. Um, so I wanna talk about first, uh, why it's important to do science-based reading instruction. Um, and I'm gonna tell you that this started with me personally. So this is my youngest sister. 
uh, Cabri, this is her age two or three, um, and she had difficulty learning to read, uh, not at age three, but later. I show you this picture because it also was taken with her brother. Uh, that is me. I think I'm at age seven, and yes, I'm wearing penny loafers and black socks. So uh, you can all judge me for that. I judge myself to this day, but you can also see why I ended up being a professor. Um, but uh, around age 13 or so, you know, I was chaffed sometimes with doing the reading homework. She really hated it. It was very hard for her. Um, and I'm sure many of you uh, know that feeling either as parents or as siblings or as someone yourself who struggle like that. So it really had an impact on me from the beginning. When I started to teach reading, this is me. I taught in California in, uh, in the early 2000s. And, um, and when I taught, I had third grade my first year teaching and I had um, like four very low performing readers. And these are two of them. Sergio and Rosa were, I think, my two lowest performing students. And they came to third grade and they could not read. And they left third grade and they could not read. Um, and that was because, first of all, I was a new teacher. But second of all, I realized even then something was not right with what I was doing. And I know that science helped because four years later, when I had learned a lot about the science of reading, Jaime and Adolfo made a year's worth of progress in like four months. And students like Tazari didn't qualify for special education services, even though that would have been expected. There's a really terrible impact on a lot of children. Um, during school, I'll share some statistics briefly. The number of fourth graders with learning disabilities and reading who are below basic is 69%. The number of years that high school students are um, below their reading grade level is about three and a half. The number of students in secondary school that failed at least one course is seven in 10. And the fraction of high school students with learning disabilities who drop out is about 20%. After high school, things are still challenging. Um, among people who uh, don't go into post-secondary education, um, the percentage who have paid employment two years later is less than half. And that unemployment rate is double that of people who uh, do not have disabilities in reading. Uh, the number of adults involved in the criminal justice system uh, who have reading difficulty within eight years of leaving high school is that's maybe about two million. I want to be clear. It doesn't mean you're going to end up like that. It just ends up that for some people that ends up being a, a cascading consequence. And finally, the highest income for 67% of adults with learning disabilities is just $25,000 a year. To demonstrate the depth of the challenge, it begins early, first graders with reading difficulties still have difficulty in fourth grade. And that's true of a lot of them. So one of these percentages is the correct percentage in terms of the number of first graders who we can later say have difficulty in fourth grade. And the number is 88%. The challenge is huge. And I wanna show you just a quick snippet of a video. Um, this is from my cousin's uh, child actually. And she had a hard time learning to read. Um, and I'm going to ha have you listen to her read just a little bit of this sentence, since I know we've got other things to talk about. It'll just be a short snippet. But I want to sort of get us in the framework of thinking why science-based reading instruction is so important. Well, we should take a hat. Some flip flops, some flip, some flip flops, and a little mat. Can you set that over for the cheese? She's almost wanted to take a hat. A so if that doesn't demonstrate uh, what it's like for families to struggle with this, <laughs> look at the words I am, I think dramatize it for all of us. Kids get frustrated, parents get frustrated. And I would say we have a societal obligation to improve literacy. Um, and I often have people finish this sentence in about 10 words um, to help us think about that. But rather than do that, I want you to think in your own mind about why we have a societal obligation to help students like uh, the little one that I just shared with you and other students who have difficulty and could end up with difficulty. Um, it has cascading effects. I'm also sure you're thinking about a student uh, you once had and keep that student in mind as we talk about the rest of this. 
In terms of the science of reading, I want to just say that when I talk about these things today, I'm talking about a set of facts. These are facts about reading acquisition and reading instruction, and it's based on those are based on data from a wide wide variety of sources of science. It's not a particular program. It's not an acronym. It's not even a social media group, although social media groups are very helpful in um, the science of reading, moving, uh, pushing that forward. Um, and it's especially important uh, to know that many practices used in schools are not based on scientific evidence. As a result of this, you all are probably aware of lots of discussions people are having about what is scientific and how educators are using science are using science in practice. And I will also just say that I think change is difficult but possible. We're in a moment where things are a little bit sharp. Something <laughs> like things are a little bit. Uh, some of the conversations are really tense, but I think that there is a possibility of long-term change. I think that is true if we really rely on science, all of us, and we're honest about the places where science is strong and not, and if we all rely on our own, we all reflect on our own practice. And especially important is to end with the fact that there's some things are true and some things are not, and I'm going to talk about those. Um, so I want to first talk about what reading is, and I'm going to talk about that in terms of just a very simple thing called the simple view of reading. I am not going to spend more than a couple of minutes on this because I'm certain that Almost all of you uh, in this group know about the simple view of reading, um, but I will share for those who are not as familiar some, some basic ideas. The idea of the simple view of reading is that reading comprehension is a combination of word recognition and language comprehension. The way I often think about that is word recognition is about kind of getting the words like through your eyeballs and then language comprehension is about spinning those words around and making sense of them. Um, these uh, those abilities are supported by a wide range of processes, and so this is just a representation of the kind of processes that are involved in word recognition and language comprehension, and how they relate to reading comprehension. Um, for those of you who know the rope graphic, this is sort of a similar, a different way to represent the, a similar kinds of ideas. And basically, the idea is that we need word recognition and language comprehension in order for students to be successful. And as many of you know all too well, the challenge for many students comes with word recognition, that when we think about language comprehension, we're thinking about spinning the words around in our mind and making sense of them. The challenge is that for many students, word recognition becomes such a hang up that they can't actually access the language. And so it becomes a barrier to doing anything in terms of reading comprehension. And models of reading comprehension show that there's an entire process you only start once you recognize the words. And particularly important is the polysyllabic words. So um, polysyllabic words, I'll talk about why I use that word. Syllables are parts in words like robot, row, and bot. These are units that contain one vowel sound. So for example, in the word bot and the word, um, the part bot, we have the onset, b, that's the beginning part, the peak, the ah uh, 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 uh sound, and then the T is called the coda. So the definition of a polysyllabic word is that it has more than one syllable, and that syllable is usually marked by a vowel. So in the word polysyllabic, you have here these vowel letters, Y representing a vowel, and that maps onto a set of sounds, and these are the vowel sounds. So I put those in those slashes. If you don't know about that, um, we usually use slashes to indicate something is about sounds. I'll also note here, I'm using the um, International Phonetic Alphabet to sort of show sounds. Um, and I do that just because, you know, you are professionals. It's good to learn some of these things, even though they're not as familiar to us. But I'll always mention what that means when it's important today. Um, so let's look at one of the syllables in, the, uh, in this. We have the syllable lab. And in lab, uh, these are the sounds in the word. So technically, syllables are sound units in words. And in those sound units, there's always that part in the middle called the peak. And the peak is the vowel sound. And you know what the peak is called a syllable. And that's what polysyllabic words are. They are units that are formed by a vowel that's often called a peak. And they're technically sounds, but we often represent them with particular letters. I use the term polysyllabic. I won't say more about that, uh, except to say, I'll explain why I say that. Um, it's really hard to say in the literature which people say more scientifically. I chose poly, even though it's less common, because it makes sense with the fact that syllable is a word of Greek origin, uh, multi is uh, of Latin origin. And so to me, it made more sense to talk about polysyllabic words. So that's why I say that one. I don't, 
I don't, uh, I don't care which one you use. I just know that's why I do it. Um, so, uh, and I've, worked, I've read a lot of studies from France and they seem particularly to use that, but um, that's, that's where sort of why I went with polysyllabic. These are really important words and I don't need to tell you that, that's why you're on this call. But I can also say that there are data that show that the number of polysyllabic words students encounter between grade one and grade eight in, uh, increases dramatically. Once we get past grade one, almost all of the words that we encounter have more than one syllable. And they're really important because they're in a lot of content area texts like photosynthesis in science, constitutional and history or civics, polynomial and math and aesthetic maybe and art. And all of those words have more than one syllable. They also have more than one morpheme. Um, and um, this is why they're so important. And syllable information can help students with their reading. And that's what we're gonna talk about. But I'm gonna to admit to start that syllables are not the easiest things on the planet. Um, one thing about the syllable that makes them hard is that the single letter vowels are challenging. Uh, a single letter vowel, I mean one letter that makes one sound. So in these words, the single letter vowels are the ones, particularly in the first syllable here, we have a single letter that makes a single sound. And so those are what I mean by um, the single letter vowels in polysyllabic words. Why should we blame them? Well, we can blame them to think of, uh, one reason to think about that is to think about how many pronunciations the letter I has in a polysyllabic word. So you can probably think of a couple. So for example, the I says the, the I sound like in viper. And you can also imagine that says the is sound like in linen. Um, now, if you thought really hard about it, you might note that the E and uh, it says the E sound. And then you have the schwa sound, the, uh, the short, very short um, uh sound. You could even say that in rabbit, you have a kind of schwa sound, sometimes called a barred I. Um, sometimes people call it a schwa. Um, it's more of an I version of the schwa. And in words like raisin, the I doesn't say anything. Um, so there are really six of them, but I always take the last two off the board because, you know, those are kind of cheating, but there are at least four ways that we can pronounce the letter I in these words, and that makes it really hard. And it's not just true for I, it's true for other letters too. A, E, I, O, U, and even Y have a long sound and have a short sound. <clears throat> and we're not going to talk about this, but it has some other sounds, it makes it even more tricky. But we can see here there are long and short sounds for every one of the single letter vowels that makes it hard for us. Um, and it's also not just that it's the vowels, the consonants are tricky uh, too. So if we think of in adventure, the sound of the T is actually a ch sound. In vision, the sound of the S is actually a zh, a zh sound. And in kitten, the middle T's actually say something called a flap kitten. We kind of swallow that sound. Um, and so in all of those words, the consonants are kind of tricky for us. So what do we do about all this? How can we possibly help? I'm gonna talk about four ways that we can help students read um, polysyllabic words. Um, so, hey, these are those. This, we're gonna talk about syllable types, syllable division, something called ishalav, and then we're gonna talk about how to use flexibility um, to help students succeed. So let's first talk about syllable types. So the first thing you wanna do is teach students that printed syllables have predictive, predictable pronunciations, that when you look at them, it's not gonna be just anything. And I think that's important because I've had students before where literally, you know, you ask them to read a word and they like look at the ceiling because like they don't trust the letters to help them, right? Like the letters are um, not the access code for them, which is, which is too bad because the letters give you all the information you need to read the word but you need to believe that there's some stuff that you can use to help you. And one of those things is to teach students about how um, words have different types of syllables, that they have more than one syllable in them. And I'm gonna tell you about a couple of those. And some of you may know this, but I know that others of you will not. So I'm gonna go through this slightly more slowly than the, um, the initiated would probably, um, but I'm just gonna make sure everybody has a similar understanding. Let me start with an open syllable and I'm gonna talk about a closed syllable and I'm gonna talk about some other types of syllables. Let's talk about first the open syllable. An open syllable is when the vowel letter comes and it's also true of sounds, comes at the end of the syllable. So let's look at the word pilot. In the word pilot, the P-I is the first syllable and the vowel is at the end. When the vowel is at the end of the syllable like that, it says it's long sound. 
And there you can see I um, put uh, this little thing called a macron, that's like sort of the eye with a line over it. Um, and that tells us it's the sound I. So when we have the syllable at the end, that's an open syllable. When the syllable's at the end, that is, um, that's, a, that's an open syllable um, and it makes the long sound. Now, I'm gonna tell you that I don't call them um, open syllables with students, I call them long vowel syllables, and I'm going to tell you why a little bit later, um, but that's something to keep in mind is the question whether we need to teach them open and closed syllables. I'm gonna come back to that point in a little bit. The second thing is that when we have a closed syllable, it works a little bit differently. The vowel comes in the beginning or the middle of a syllable. So instead of the PI like in pi pilot, we now have the PI like in pillow. And in pillow, we can divide the word in this way. So we have P-I-L. And now we have a closed syllable. The vowel is not at the end. It's in the middle of the syllable. This can also be true if it's at the beginning. But in this, uh, this case, it's in the middle of the syllable. And when that is the case, uh, the vowel says it's short sound. And we can put um, this little line over that to illustrate that that's I always call it like the smiley face, um, you know, sort of arc or whatever. And when we have the smiley face arc, we don't, I, sorry, I say it this way, it's called a brev, but the, I just put it here, not because you necessarily need to teach it to students, but just so those of you who are interested in knowing um, how we write the short and long vowels, often that's the way we'll write them um, when we're referring to the short and the long sound. So that's the short sound. As I pointed out before, I don't typically call these uh, closed syllables. I'll refer to them as short vowel syllables, and I'll explain a little bit more about that, as I said, in a little bit. So again, open syllables, vowel at the end, long sound, closed syllable, vowel in the middle, short sound. So what we can do is we can teach students about this information and we can have them read words using this syllable idea. And this comes from a study that was a couple of studies that were done in the actually the late 80s and early 90s, where they found that having students practice reading long and short vowel syllables was actually really helpful. So for example, you might say, let's practice reading long and short vowel syllables. The teacher would remind the students the vowel at the end, it makes the long sound. So what does that say? Your turn lie, okay? Then we say vowel in the middle makes the short sound, lin. Your turn, what's the word? Lin. Now we have the vowel at the end, it's long, it's toe. What is it? Your turn, toe. And then short vowel is in the middle, um, and we say that says rom, and now your turn, and it says rom. With the vowels in the middle, we remind students it's short, and this says lem, and that's your turn, that says lem. Now it's your turn to read some syllables and here are a bunch of syllables that follow those patterns. So just take a look at those for a second. What you'll notice is that these are syllables, not words. So for example, you'll notice that T-O is toe um, rather than being two. Um, and you'll also notice that M-I is my rather than me. Um, and for L-I I said lie um, rather than Lee. And then L-E in this case is, al is also is Lee here as well. So um, that would be like a lemur rather than at the end, like an apple. It is true that the end of a word, some people call a stable final syllable, but often the letters at the end of a word with le, it almost always has the ol sound like an apple or staple. Um, but we're focusing on them as um, syllables that are at the beginning or in the middle of a word. We teach students that the vowels at the end says the long sound, vowel in the middle, or at the beginning says the short sound. And we have students read um, syllables like that to get them used to the idea that vowels at the end say the long sound, vowels in the middle or the beginning say the short sound. That's really important for the next thing that, that I'll say after that about how to break words into parts. Let me talk now about what I was mentioning before, which is that we want to sort of limit the amount of talk about open and closed syllables. And what I want to share with you is that it's really important to limit what I'm going to call meta knowledge. Meta knowledge is uh, meta is about information related to important knowledge. So it's not the knowledge itself, it's information related to it. The way to think about it in reading is that this is information about words that teachers need, but students don't. And if you've ever taken a course or done um, you know, workshops on the science of reading, you probably learned uh, all these terms like open and close and learned a lot of other things as well. Uh, and people learn a lot of terminology and then they 
uh, learn strategies for describing that content as well. And one really common one is a, uh, one example of that I like to give is the syllable house. Okay. So the syllable house, this is a strategy. Here's the syllable house if you don't know about it. The way it works is that when you have a, um, this is a closed, this is a closed syllable because the door is closed. And when the door is closed, the vowel says the short sound. And then the idea is you can say, well, if we put now the door is open, we open the door and now the vowel can say its name, right? So that is a way of explaining to students the language open and close and getting them to remember it. And if you've uh, never seen that before, um, that's what it is. And now you should promptly forget it because it's a really terrible idea. Um, and so one thing I want you to remember is um, that all of this is a really bad idea and that um, if you remember nothing else from today, please don't teach the syllable house. So that is my, I put that in a big, I spent a like, I spent like five to 10 minutes making this slide because I thought it was so important for you all to remember. The syllable house is not a good idea. The reason again is that that is meta knowledge. It's extra stuff that's related to knowing about the open and closed syllables, but it's not what students need to know, which is how to use them. And similarly, I don't use the terms open and closed because it's not clear it's necessary for students to know the terms, right? Yes, so it's open, meaning you know it's at the end of the syllable or it's closed, it's not at the end of the syllable. And those things have linguistic, so they're, they're like, they, those names are sort of derived from linguistics and actually how we talk about sounds and how we process sounds. And then typically um, long vowels come at the end um, and sometimes linguists call them open syllables, but we don't necessarily need to teach that to kids. It's great for you to know as an educator, um, and, um, but it's not something necessarily that students need to know. Um, so, uh, so, um, so that's, um, so that's example of meta knowledge. When someone put in the, um, chat that like a story or image can help them remember the words, I would not do that. I would not recommend using a story or image because we want to make sure what we're, our goal is for them to link the letters to the sounds. And so what we always want to do is make that explicit connection to what they're reading. When we're having them kind of step outside of the reading, that becomes sort of its own separate thing that I get why we would do it. But basically I wouldn't want to do it because I want to focus students explicitly on how the words work and getting them to think within the word. Because the way to think about it is when you're reading, you need something quick and easy to help you get through that word. And that's why something like knowing about the open and closed syllables, call them open and closed, call them long or short vowel. But if you know, that the vowel at the end says the long sound and you know the vowel in the middle says the short sound. That's powerful information to help you when you read. Extra stuff, even if it's designed to help students remember, it might take students out of it. Um, and rather, I'd rather have them focus on the letter. So is that always true? No. So there are cases where maybe a strategy is, is a good idea, but um, in general, that's something I like, hopefully you'll take away from today. Um, and again, you know, for the syllable house, it's way outside what we're actually doing when we read, and that's why it's not recommended, or that's not why, that's why I don't recommend it. Um, so one of the things that you can do to help students with this is to, you can teach them to practice vowel pronunciations, and you can teach them to say the short sounds and the long sounds for the vowels. So this helps students when they are, we're trying to increase their flexibility in terms of using those. So we just have them say the short sound, have them say the long sound, and I have students practice the pronunciation of why. There are four of them. There's the constant pronunciation. People dis disagree about how to say, I say y, um, although some people would say it's e. If you ever taught reading master, you'd say it's e, um, but I say y, and then you have the e sound like in pretty, you have the i sound like in fly, and you have the is sound like in gym. So we always do those um, to remind students that those are the pronunciations of Y because um, the letter Y at the end of a word is actually very common. And so it's important for students to be aware of that. So those are the syllable types that are important for students to, to know. They need to know about those open and closed syllables. Less clear is whether we need to teach students about other kinds of syllables. So we talked about open and closed. Those are all good. Those are good to teach. Then there are a few others that people often teach, like the vowel consonant E syllables, sometimes called the final E syllable. Um, for these, I don't think that there's a real, there's not a really clear answer about whether or not it's a good idea to do this. The data aren't clear that it's a bad idea either. 
I tend not to focus on it because the way I think about it is kids already know these patterns from seeing words that have them in it. And so I tend to rely on the fact that they already know vowel consonant E when I do this, but I don't really have an objection to teaching students about that. Um, I just think that it might not be necessary. There's also an R controlled syllable. When the letter R comes after a vowel, um, it, it always makes a mess of the letter R is really complicated in basically every language. And so um, it will make a difference. So sometimes people call that a vowel R syllable or an R controlled syllable. I prefer vowel R because it makes it a little bit easier to say. And the idea of R control doesn't make a lot of sense to kids necessarily. Um, there's also the consonant LE syllable. Um, sometimes people call it a stable final syllable. Um, I like consonant LE again, because it's simpler and easier to remember. Doesn't add new knowledge for them. And that's like an apple. That one is a good one to teach, actually teaching students that consonantly at the end of a word says the ol sound with the consonant because that occurs very frequently. And finally, you have vowel team syllables. So I'm gonna call this a um, vowel team syllable um, for an important reason. One, the reason is that vowel, I don't wanna say digraph or vowel digraph. The reason I don't say vowel digraph is they're not all digraphs. So if you don't know what a digraph is, it's two letters that make one sound, di to graph, um, graph meaning letters. Um, and so the problem is that IGH is a vowel, um, it like makes a vowel sound and that's not two letters, that's a trigraph technically. I don't think it's necessary for students to know the word um, digraph or trigraph. There's also a technical problem where if, uh, there's certain things called um, diphthongs. It's not important for you to know, except that it makes it more complicated because like OI says OI and it's different than a digraph. And so it's all kinds of complicated. Um, so it's why uh, I like to call it, if I'm gonna teach about the syllable types at all, I teach about vowel team syllables. It's not clear that all of these need to um, be defined, but it's also not necessarily a bad idea. So I, there's not a lot of science on this, so I'm not gonna say you shouldn't do it. Um, I couldn't say for sure. I know that you know from science, the open and closed syllable part is important. And obviously students need to know all those other pieces. The fact that constant least should be taught as a unit, that's just, Devin saying that like that's really important. Um, I mean, although I think you all would probably agree, but um, that's the information about um, syllable types that you might teach students. The next thing to talk about is syllable division, which is teaching students a strategy for dividing words into syllables. Okay, it's really common in programs, especially programs for kids with difficulty. Here are some imaginary names of programs that I turned into other programs because I didn't want to call out any particular program. None of these actually exists. I just made these up to sort of illustrate. There are at least this many programs that many of you will know that um, are many of them are Orton Gillingham based. Um, and um, the data about the value of teaching syllable division is not strong. There, um, so there was a study, something called a meta-analysis of Orton-Gillingham, I think it was last year now, and it sort of showed Orton-Gillingham has maybe okay effects, uh, meaning it wasn't like, they weren't huge, um, but they also weren't tiny, and um, I don't, the data do not suggest Orton-Gillingham is a bad idea. But what the data also don't suggest is that this particular part of it called syllable division is necessarily a good idea, and that's what I'm going to talk about in terms of um, syllable division. There are, I've done, I've done some research on like counting the number of programs that teach about syllable division um, for intervention. And it's kind of about half and half. Half the programs teach about syllable division, half of them don't. Um, and programs on both sides have positive evidence of improving student achievement. So it's not that syllable division is necessarily a bad idea um, if you do it, and particularly if you do it in a particular way, which I'm gonna call the flexible way. Um, but there are ways to do it that are much less flexible that um, people really like. Uh, I'm, I'm going to tell you that the data on teaching those more complex strategies are not strong, um, but I think it's still, I wanted to make sure um, that uh, Val, that we, you know, we want to make sure we talk about it because it is really common. Um, and so, um, so I'm going to talk about what these patterns are, okay? So syllable division patterns are ways to break up words when you have a single letter vowel, you already talked about two consonants and then another vowel. So the syllable division pattern then is that when you have a vowel, two consonants and a vowel, you divide the word into syllables between the consonants. So that works really well in a word like rabbit. So you divide rabbit 
between the consonants, following your rules of V, C, C, V, okay? And then that little smiley face thing comes back that I talked about before. We have a closed syllable now. We already know about that. And we know that in a closed syllable, the vowel says the short sounds. We know that that's rab. So the pattern is that we have two consonants between vowels and we break it into two parts between the consonants. First syllable says the syllables. In the first syllable, the vowel says that short sound. The second pattern is the VCV pattern. The primary VCV pattern is that you break the word after the first vowel letter. And when you do that, the vowel there makes the long sound. So that's, remember that's the line means it's the long sound. So in the word tiger, use the vowel constant vowel pattern. You break it after the I, um, and so after the first vowel, and you have an open syllable. At the end, we have the I, so the vowel says the I sound. So, but one thing that's challenging about this is it doesn't work all the time. And one of the things that, this is a good example of where I sort of interrogated my own practice. This is where I decided as a researcher, I might access to a lot of word databases and I did an analysis of words in English. Um, Cause I started to think like, does this stuff really work, right? I taught it, I've taught a number of programs um, that are familiar to many of you. Um, and many of them had syllable division in them. And I, you know, first I thought it was really cool. I was like, this is so amazing, right? Like there's a pattern to this stuff and we can teach kids the pattern and the pattern will help them. And especially the um, open syllable and the VCV, I was like, oh, there's a way for students to know if it's the I sound or the I sound in tiger. So they know it's tie and not tick. That felt really empowering to me. And as a teacher, I was really excited to teach students about it because um, it seemed like it was gonna be helpful to them. But as I taught more and more, I would like find all these words where it didn't work. And I started to think, how helpful is this actually for students? So here's the analysis that I did. So this is, um, so I did an analysis. So it was a tiny bit of research. Um, and this is just an analysis of words, not of kids. This is just an analysis of words. I looked at, I think, 13,000 English words. And I looked at how often do they follow the rule? Um, in other words, how, when you have a V, C, C, V word, does the vowel say the short sound, the first vowel say the short sound? And I found that it really is good, okay? So if you look at this graph, what you can see here is the pink um, and then the black over here. The pink shows us the, uh, the fraction of the time that it says what it's, quote, supposed to. It says the short sound. And the other ones are come some kind of random ones where it says, ah, like in water. And then the um, reduced vowel, it's like the schwa sound. Um, so it's very frequently, it says what it's a, kind of supposed to, it says the short sound. And that's true for all of the, um, the, uh, the, the short letter, sorry, the single letter vowels in the bisyllab, but these are just two syllable words. I'm um, in the VCCV pattern, it's really uh, common. You can expect that it's gonna say the short sound. So that's pretty good. When we look at the um, long, uh, when we look at the VCV pattern, it is not very good. So if you look at the VCV pattern, where again, we want that first vowel to say the long sound, we break it after the first vowel, um, then it didn't work very well. So you can see here, particularly with um, the A is not very good and the E is not very good. In fact, they're so uh, bad that you would actually potentially consider teaching students the opposite for the E, that like the E says the short sound first because it's so, um, it's much less frequent that the E says the E sound rather than the, than the S sound. So there's, we might actually say like, you know, why would you possibly um, teach the students that when it doesn't work very well? So that was a problem that I identified was that when you look at words, they don't follow the, these kinds of words, the VCV words, they don't follow the patterns as often as we would like them to. And as a result, it might not be as helpful to do this as we think. So that was, you know, this is me kind of like, kind of think about science free. This was one of these moments in my career where I was like, I got, I have to look at data because I want to be scientific about it. When I looked at the data, they didn't like pan out the way I wanted them to. I also thought, you know, it's a lot of work for kids to do this. And I started to wonder, like, is it worth it for kids to learn to break the words into parts this way? Because if you're reading, that's going to be a really tough thing for you to do as you're reading. Now, a lot of people will say, and I think this is fair, that, you know, you don't necessarily have kids do it while they're reading. They learn this process and they can internalize it. 
And I'm not going to say that that's wrong. It's just that the, there are a lot of words where it doesn't work. And there are a lot of programs where um, it, it, you know, it, uh, where you can teach students to be successful without doing that. Um, and so uh, my key message is that, um, and I wrote a paper about this um, with some of my doctoral students um, that's in the Reading League journal that you can read. And I talked about civil division and um, why you might teach it or might not teach it. So that might be of interest to you um, if you're a member of the Reading League. And some of these papers I can email to you if you send me your email address. I can email you like an author's version of the paper. It won't look the same, but it will be give you the same information. And basically, you know, I talked about the fact that like we don't know enough to be certain that the civil division is a good idea. Um, but I also want to say that like I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea. And I really um, like this quote because this is what shows me that you know for some people civil division actually might be helpful. Um, and this is a quotation from a paper I think it was in yeah it was in the eighties in the Annals of Dyslexia, which is the uh, International Dyslexia Association journal. And some and this person, it's an adult with uh, dyslexia, said, "Knowing basic phonics is not enough." an efficient, structured, logical, scientifically reliable automatic system for dividing and pronouncing longer words was an essential prerequisite for my academic literacy. And this person is talking about syllable division. And so you can see there in this one instance that someone really felt like this was important for their learning. And I'm not gonna say that that wasn't true. Like in their particular case, it was. Um, and I think that's um, a testament to the fact that it's, I'm not saying that it would never work uh, I'm just saying that um, it, you know, there are some reasons to be, there's enough reason to not be sure to think about whether or not it's a good idea. And what I finished with in this paper is the idea that, um, uh, that you know, um, if you teach civil division and you think it really works for students, that's great. And that's a practice that you have, you know, been using. That's great. Here's the one thing I want you to take away, think about is like, you made your kids made lots of progress that way. And the question is like, could they have made even more progress if you taught them a different way? So I'm not gonna say that civil division is a bad idea for a lot of people, but I just want you to keep in mind the idea like maybe something else can work. Um, and so, so we can do something else, right? Here are some other patterns um, that people use. We have a VCV. There's the alternative to the VCV, the dragon pattern, which I didn't talk about yet. And I'm going to explain why I didn't um, a little bit later. But basically, um, you're sort of switching where you put the, the um, division line. There's also a VV pattern where between two, like in NIAG, we, Donna was asking, how do you say our name of our school? It's NIAG, so it actually has the VV pattern, which I always think is funny. There's also like instant, which is, you know, VCCCV. And then there's VCCCCCV. Um, the only word that has that in English is actually the word offspring, so don't teach that one to, um, to students. But um, that's, that's basically the, um, that's sort of the message about civil division. Um, we have a video of me teaching it. I'm not going to have you watch it because basically it includes, uh, if we have time at the end, I'll, I'll play it, but basically includes me doing a lot of things you shouldn't do um, to do this. I taught civil division by the book um, and it was not a good idea, but I share it just to embarrass myself mostly and to have <laughs> that you shouldn't do, but I'm not going to do it. Not because I don't want to do that, but because I want to talk about some other strategies. So here's what is a, this is a really powerful one. This is Ishalav. So Ishalav is the idea that every syllable has at least one vowel. So in the word fantastic, you have the A and the A and the I, and those are um, followed the Ishalav rule because we have every syllable has at least one vowel. In the word reduce, we actually have, yes, Ishalav. The E says is one, and then the U and the E go together. That makes another one. So that follows Ishalav. Now, you could take it and you could break it up this way where you put the E and the U together, but that doesn't work. That doesn't follow the Ishalav. So if you do it the other way, then that one works. Then you can divide the word into syllables between vowels. You can divide it like that, and that looks okay. You can divide it like that, and actually that looks okay too. We have NT and ST at the end of, so, of words, so those are that's divided okay as well. Um, and then we have the word reduce, and if we break it up this way, then we can break it up that way, and it works. It follows the um, our pattern, and then we can also say um, if we break it here, that also works. Now, it's not necessarily going to uh, work when you try to read the word, but it's going to work fine. I'm going to explain more about that. It can work fine for breaking into parts. So every syllable has at least one vowel. 
So one thing that's a good idea to do is to have students mark out, or when you're teaching students to read, read, you know, you can mark them yourself and use some sort of way of indicating that you have a vowel consonant E by linking those together in some way. Um, so a little bit less clear if the uh, view is helpful. Um, so I'm not gonna have you do this exercise to look at acceptable syllables, but remember every syllable has at least one vowel and some of those work and some of those don't. Okay, so then the thing we're gonna do with that is we're gonna teach students to break word, we're gonna have them read words using flexibility. To do what I'm about to show you, they have to know the long vowel and short vowel patterns we talked about. They need to open and close syllables. So what you do is you can, here's a word like linen, and then you use a syllable card and you cover the word in parts. And so when they cover it, students already know because you taught them the vowel at the end is a long sound. So when they, when they look at this, they say lie. And then they take away the card and they say nen. And then they try to figure out if it's a word. And that doesn't work. That doesn't say a word they know. Lie nen isn't a word. So then they can divide it the other way. They put the vowel in the middle. It says the I sound. And now we have lin n. And people say to me, and I think it's fair, say like, well, isn't that the same as the VCV pattern? And the answer is yes, but you don't need a, you don't need a rule. All you need to do is have every syllable has at least one vowel. And then you break it in some way and you test whether it works. So here's how you do it. Um, so here's the kind of the strategy. So first you mark the vowels like I talked about. So you have the A and I underlined the OR because if you teach students that that's a vowel R syllable then you can put those together. Um, and so you have the syllable card, right? So you break it into parts like that. The student knows about the um, long sound for the open syllable. And so they say may, right? And then they look at the other part of the word and it says jor. And they say, what word sounds like that? And they say major, 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 right? So they know what word that is. So then we can, um, yeah, Kara, I'm gonna come back to your point. Uh, so then we can look at the word dragon um, in a similar kind of way. So you mark the syllables in dragon. Um, now we try it this way, dre, okay? And then we have, because we know it's at the end, it says a long sound. And then we have gone. We have the, actually, this is a, oh, a closed syllable. The vowels in the middle says the short sound, gone. So there's gone. And I think, what word sounds like that? Dre, gone, dre, gone. That's not a word. And then you can try the other way. So this is the cool part. So now we still have our, uh, uh, every syllable has at least one vowel. And then we can take our syllable card and break it up the other way. Now we know we have a closed syllable or a um, short vowel syllable, and we know it says the short sound, and now it says drag, and then that says on, and we think what word sounds like that? Dragon, dragon. And so the students then have access to the entire word. Um, so, um, so uh, let's see. Yeah, so then there's major again. Oh yeah, so this is what I have to talk about. Okay, so I, um, so, yeah, they're really good question about words that are in their vocabulary. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about that right now. Um, and it is true, Catherine, that every syllable has at least one vowel sound. But for the purposes of instruction, we're going to teach students about the vowels. Um, the, I talked about that early on, about the syllables are actually anchored by a sound. But we're going to talk about them as letters because that's this is actually a strategy that a researcher used in a very successful study. Um, and so, um, so... This is the point about the like, what do you like? It gets at the schwa sound. It gets at the like, what if they don't know the word kind of thing. So if we take major again and we say madge and AJ is weird at the end of a word. Let's say that we say, okay, the vowel is at the, uh, in the middle, says so the short sound. So that's madge. And then we say the OR and it says, or what word sounds like that? Madge or that doesn't work. Try it the other way. So now we have uh, the, the may. Now we have jor and we think, what word sounds like that? Here's the thing that we're doing. What we actually have to do is we actually have to turn major into major, okay? So you can see there I have jor and then jor becomes jur. So what happens is students actually have to um, practice um, adjusting syllable pronunciations, something called set for variability. And what you need to do is to teach students that Something's not always going to sound quite like a word, and they need to um, try to make it into a word that they know. So that's a key point, is that they're always trying to sort of say, I'll say, link to the lexicon. 
So this doesn't mean that they're going to um, use context clues. It doesn't mean that they're not going to try to read the word, but they're always, we're always going to try to get them to link it to the lexicon. And there aren't really great rules for that about when it's a sh uh, schwa sound, a, sh a, re sound, a reduced vowel, like in major, like that second part, like the, e the OR sounds like an ER, like an ER sound. Um, and all of that, we need to teach students, they need to adjust it. They need to be flexible. Um, and eventually they need to link it to the lexicon. And there have been some studies about this and I've done a little bit of this work and others have too. And uh, data seem to suggest that if you teach students about um, making this link, uh, you know, sort of adjusting pronunciation, it can really help them um, be successful in reading words. So that's the last part of that puzzle. Um, so, um, so a couple of questions. So, um, yeah, so we've got to ask, can you share the study? It's, there's information about it in the PowerPoint, even though I'm not going to talk about it. Um, because I there's a whole section on this um linking to the lexicon piece that I'm not going to talk about. Um, how do you clue the student? I usually say, Kara, like just try it the other way. Um, and Marion says it doesn't really help for spelling. I think it helps some for spelling, but it is true that it's not going to help as much for spelling. Um, spelling in English requires a lot of rules. Um, and so um so Kara, there are no data that I know about teaching syllable stress. This is where you have to kind of do that adjusting thing, which you actually mentioned before. Lisa asked about how I feel about nonsense syllables. I think that, um, well, when you read syllables, like I did, you know, I showed you the lie and the, all those ones that have the open and close, those are nonsense and I think that's okay. Teaching students to read nonsense words is trickier. I think the thing I always worry about is that like, if you teach English learners to read like, you know, uh, nonsense words is sort of like now you're adding words that they don't know already. Um, the one thing I'll say is that sometimes you're going to run into words that are like, you know, they're not super high in frequency, but students might know them and you have to kind of decide, is this a, a word students, you know, should be able to read? Um, because, you know, it can be tricky um, because you think, well, do they, are they familiar with that word or not? And sometimes you're not sure. And that's, I um, mean, that's where I sort of, uh, you know, that's where I think it is important for students to be familiar with the words that you are having them read. Sometimes I recommend, and this isn't a research-based practice necessarily, there aren't data on this, but I usually will at the beginning of the lesson tell students what the words are um, and have them pronounce them. I'll give them a definition. And then as we do the lesson, we'll come back and we'll pronounce those words. Um, even though I already said them to them, now they have a link to the lexicon. They have heard the words before. So that's not something that I've actually validated with research, um, but it seems to me to be a good idea to get students in the, into that. So, um, so yeah, Lisa, I, I, yeah. So, I mean, the one situation I, in which I use nonsense uh, words when kids are like, you know, I will say inveterate guessers, like they just won't not guess. Like, if, you know, if they won't um, stop trying to link everything to a word before they sound it out, like they, before they, they have to put the pieces together after they look at the part. So this is an important thing I didn't really say. The part where you like try to figure out what word it is comes after the part where you try, you figure out what the parts are, okay? This is why it's not like whole language in that I'm not talking about guessing based on some of the letters. I'm talking about figuring out how to say it and then linking to the lexicon, um, meaning then figuring out what word it is. And that is a, that idea is strongly supported by evidence that the letters are the access code and you need students to be able to use the letters but it sometimes won't be enough. And then you need to use that flexibility um, part of it. So that's why I want to be really clear about the letters of the access code start with that. And then we do the link to the lexicon kind of piece. Um, so, uh, so Lindsay, you say, if you have to teach this name to syllable, don't focus a lot on it. I think that's right. I think, you know, if you're doing it in a program like Foundations already, I would say don't mess with it, right? If they're, you're already doing it, it seems to be working. I'd say, you know, don't try to change, you know, what is it, the thing, like, don't change horses midstream, like, just let it go and, like, do it. I wouldn't spend a lot of time on it. Don't expect students have to know it and all that. Thinking about what you're, think about what you teach them about open and closed. Um, but I think that, you know, as long as you're not, you know, sort of making it like, you have to memorize all these, then I think it's okay. Um, so I wouldn't change everything about it. Um, and so, yeah, so thanks. Um, uh, what, so, Carlos, what did I call major, major to major? It's like flexibility, basically. I used to say, tune it like the radio to make it come in better. And now that doesn't work anymore because <laughs> the radio is. Uh, so I said, now I say, like, tune it like a guitar to make it sound better. So I sort of adjust it. 
um, that kind of thing. Um, the last thing I want to just share with you all is I'm going to share with you a um, so I put in the chat, um, I put two things in the chat and Donna, thank, thank you for keeping uh, those there. One thing I wanted to share with you that um, isn't the presentation is a separate thing, um, which is the word recognition lesson design workbook, um, which I think you will probably find helpful. What I did in this is I um, created a uh, document that lists um, like, <laughs> A whole bunch of strategies for how to read words and how to practice things. So it has like a guide at the beginning and then it has like different strategies that you can use with students. It's not finished. So some of the things like, you know, you can't use, like there's not parts about all the spelling stuff. But the reason I mention it to you is that the part about um, with the vowels and the syllables that is in here. So if you want to teach students about how to, you know, divide the words into syllables and that kind of thing, that is in here. So you can look at that. Um, you can look at that to teach students about that. So um, there's also things about how to teach students about high frequency words and all kinds of things that you'll probably be interested in. And so please take a look at that. Um, I always ask you like, you know, credit me for the fact that I spent some time on it. If you really like it, if you hate it, you know, you can tell them it's me, but you know, maybe not. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, whatever you say is fine. I did make it. And, you know, I'm also happy for your feedback too. Um, and then the last thing I'm going to share, which some of you may know about, is I made a website called Finder. So if you go to devinkearns.com, I apologize, I actually have a website, um, .com, it seems so silly, but uh, if you go to devinkearns.com slash Finder, it starts with a PH, Finder, you can see it here, and it's a way to pick um, words that have a pattern you want to teach the students. So let's do the let's do the long sound. Let's do the open syllable pronunciation for the A. So we have the A, and the A says the long sound. So we do the A with a line over it. There it is. And then there it appears. A says A, and then you click search for words. And it will bring up all the words that it has where the A says A, and there are a lot of them. So when you're trying to find words to do the things that I talked about, you can look at this list um, by using Finder. Um, and the words are listed in order of frequency. Um, and then there are options too, where if you just want words with like two syllables or ones that are more frequent, you can do that too. So that's just another tool. So I wanna share that with you as well. So, all right, Don, I'm wow. sorry. I took, a bunch of, I took a bunch of questions. So I thought, um, I thought, you know, I figured I was taking questions as we went, so that may be okay. But we have time for a couple more. If you, you know, you're the boss. So if you have a question, I, I think it's- We've got a show. few more minutes. So anyone okay. have any questions? Uh, let's see here. Well, thank you all for the kind words. I always appreciate that. that appreciate that too. Um, is Finder, no, Finder is not just letter combination. It has vowel teams in it. It's two, uh, two Allison. So, um, so if you look here, you can see there's like CK. Let me make this a little bit bigger. So you can say CK is here. It doesn't just have the ones on this list. These are just examples. But so you can search for like EA. And so here's EA and it says E, you want to find those words. And so it will, um, it'll show you, here are all the EA words. So it'll do um, vowel teams as well. Um, one relatively uh, unused feature is that you can actually do it with, um, you can do it with a T that says T. <laughs> You can actually combine those. I don't. People don't really use that very much because it doesn't it is not obvious to them. But if you want to do like EAT says eat, you can actually do that too, um, which is kind of cool. But nobody really uses that because I didn't really explain it very clearly in the in the website. Um, so, um, Catherine yeah, it, you, yeah. Oh. Catherine sent you some questions privately. I don't know if you can find them. Okay, let me see if I can get those, <clears throat> Catherine. Um, let's see. Which Catherine? Catherine. Oh, what's her name? Um, with a C. It's hard to go back. Let's see. Uh, oh, Donna said, do, okay. Catherine, Catherine okay. Let me, So let me see if I can find them going back here. Um, Catherine. Uh, Catherine, you asked, what do you think about some of the speech to print programs who teach several graphemes for one phoneme at once? <laughs> well, I know some people who are really into that. Um, so I think I, the data on that are neither strong nor weak. So actually, there's a researcher named Mark Seidenberg who actually pretty much believes that you should do that, that you um, you need to teach students, uh, maybe not exactly the same time, but it's not a bad idea to get students used to um, understanding different pronunciations 
even in a short period of time. So, you know, in terms of like doing them on the same day or whatever, I don't, I don't think there are data on that, but getting students to practice that flexibility, even within um, syllables, I think is actually not such a bad thing to do. Um, and so I think that's, um, so I actually don't, their data on that aren't good or weak. Um, but they're just, I don't know, I don't know them very well, except to say that theory suggests and some of Mark Seidenberg's research suggests that it is a good idea to teach some of those um, in the way that that um, that the folks like Donna recommend. I don't know, Donna, if you want to elaborate on that at all. Oh, I'm, I'm definitely convinced that uh, speech to print is a little better approach um, yeah. as opposed to an OG. Uh, um, you know, I did OG forever. I, I'm Wilson trained. Um, I did Project Read, and um, I have a problem keeping kids in a program for three to five years, and it's just yeah. it just takes forever, and they age yeah. out, and yeah. and you lose them, you know, because they don't want to come to tutoring, um, mm -hmm. and so if there's a faster way to do it that's more efficient and effective, why wouldn't I want to know about that? Yeah, I think that's good, and I think. One of the things I like about um, the emphasis you have is on like lots of practice. I mean, I always say practice wins every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Like students need to do this stuff a lot. They need to have a lot of exposure. I always say count the number of words kids are reading per minute. If that number is low, then you're not doing it right. You know, you've got to get students reading a lot. And mm -hmm. so I think that that idea is really, is really key. So yeah, thanks for that. For sure. Um, the third way is eshalav, which is true. We we don't do that. We don't say, okay, let's find all the vowels. Let's work it out that way. That's just, it's not I really done. like that. I didn't, that was created by a researcher named Rolando Connor, who actually has a book called Word Recognition. And she did a number of studies of this and showed that it was really effective. Um, and so, mm -hmm. so I think like, that's why I bought into it because I was like, well, the data indicate that it's, it works. So I was all, it was all about it. Um, so I think, you know, I mean, I think Catherine, you also asked like, you know, um, for folks who do OG stuff, what do you do? You know, that's the hard one, right? So if you have the flexibility in your program to make decisions on your own, you, I would think about whether or not you need to teach syllable division to that extent, but, um, you know, but some people, you know, like I already said before, you know, if it's working for students, mm -hmm. like I'm not necessarily going to say like, throw out everything that you're doing. But I would say the question for me is always like, could I get more benefit if we did it a different way? And I think for me, it's that practice piece. Syllable division is slow and time consuming. And Donna, I think what you said too is really important. People emphasize like total mastery all the time. So, you know, you can't go past the short vowels until you know them. And so kids are like in a program for like two years learning short vowels. Like that's another thing is like, you can't, you know, perseverate on the same topic forever and ever. You need to move on. And that's one of the things that, you know, Don, about the work that you and your colleagues have done, I think is so important is that you're emphasizing practice and, um, you know, continuing to give students uh, more information and expand their knowledge, not just sticking on something because they don't have it perfectly mastered. For many of you, you know this, Absolutely. like kids don't master the short vowels forever. Like kids will mix up the short vowels, like, you know, three years after they should have worn them. So if you're going to be stuck on the short vowels, it's going to be a long time before they're perfect because they're a little bit tricky. Um, they're even trickier than long vowels sometimes. So I always say, you know, like they need to know them pretty well, but if they're getting them most of the time, move on, do some other stuff and reinforce it, go back. Spiral review is really the answer. The, the data are so clear that you don't want to do mass practice. Like let's just keep doing short vowels. You want to do distributed practice, teach short vowels, get them good, and then bring them back over time um, so students can practice them. Well, um, and th this gets back to the conversation we had that um, if we're limiting kids to just CBC words and then we move on to CCV words and it, it it's that laborious process where oh if, we, if we can get to the chase and not expect mastery because there's other things that are in play here when kids are reading it's not just about decoding what they take into account um 
the sense of the sentence and what the context is about set for variability plays in there and then and then the um self teaching hypothesis you know exposure will bring more words to your lexicon to your you know um your orthographic mapping it just keeps building. keeps building on each other and i think again um i just think it's important that we we are aware of all these ways to approach reading. Um, that's yeah. why we're here. <laughs> At least that's, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Yeah, to I totally agree with that. And one of the things I'll say, just kind of looking at the chat, is a lot of you are, first of all, getting the connections with other programs like Anita Archer's rewards. Like, yes, they have this covert strategy built into that, which is sort of like a shorthand kind of strategy um, that can be effective for students sometimes. And um, like the way that people describe with letters, I'm not as familiar with letters. I mean, I know the about the training, but I've never gotten into the weeds of it because um, mm -hmm. I don't have that training. But like circling prefixes and suffixes and underlying vowels, yes, that has evidence. You don't necessarily need to square the suffixes rather than circling them, um, but that can be helpful. And there's a section in the presentation that I um, put in there that is, um, uh, about uh, to show you all, um, sorry, pause for a second because I want to find something for you all. Um, okay, okay, got it. Is that the right one? Sorry, I'm just trying to find a paper that I can share. I have a I have this paper on reading long words that I like, but I only, I have the version for I can share. There's like two versions, one I can share and one that I can't. Um, because one was like the version I made before the publisher. Um, let me see if I get really fast. Um, um, so, so I just think that like a lot of you have like the right idea and no, you know, already getting that, which is amazing because pretty clear, you know, your students are in great shape if you're, um, if, if they know that. So, um, give me one more second to see if I can find this thing because that would be really helpful to be able to share with you. Okay, we have a request for more speech to print webinars. Um, actually, that's in the work page. Um, I'm working with some of the um, uh, some of the folks that are that have that those programs out. We're trying to um, bring that to the forefront. Awesome. Um, wait, did I find it? I did. Oh, awesome. Okay. Um, Yay. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Sorry, it took so long. So this is a paper I wrote several years ago um, with a colleague of mine, uh, Victoria Whaley. And um, and this is like, this is, it doesn't look like a real paper because I'm not allowed to share the real paper, but this version, which is mostly the same, I am allowed to share because I edited it myself. Um, so um, so you can look at that for some some long word strategies too. So, um, so yeah, so that's that too. So awesome. Okay, so what we'll do is I will send all these links to uh, it'll be in the um like probably the youtube you in the notes and so you'll have all that and you know devin will send us um the, the powerpoints already in the chat right yep powerpoints in the chat oh. and i'll send you a link to all these things together so the powerpoints in the chat um there's also again that workbook thing i showed and then yep. i'll put i'll i'll uh, and then there's an article that i just put in there um, and then um, also I'll just put a link to Finder, which um, people can. Right. So, so yeah, so I'm just, I'm, I'm just going to send this to you now, like as a Word document. Perfect. Um, Excellent. Okay. And for those of you that are still on, just so you know, the three little dots at the bottom on the right hand side, if you click on that, it's a save chat, you can download it right to your computer. So you'll have all that information instantly. Okay. Thank you so much. You know, I think I'm thinking we're going to have to have you back, Devin. <laughs> well, no doubt be, in my mind. <laughs> I would be honored to come back. I like it's really fun for me, and I like the questions a lot. You know, too to like I hear what you all are thinking and um, so on. So that would be awesome. I love that. Well, you know, we're all on this cusp of wanting to know more, and and you know, what are our options when we want it when we're teaching kids? So I think this is just a win-win for everyone. Awesome. All right. Thank you again for your time right. and expertise. Love, love having you on. Yeah, right. thank you for having me. It was really fun. Happy holidays to everyone. And um, too. Of course, we'll be in, I'll be in touch with you. All right. Thank sounds you. good. Bye, All right. Bye-bye.